This is FE Peer Review. The date is March 30th, 2021. The video in review is Naturalism of the Gaps, Dishonesty in Practice. My thanks to Rusty Walker for his own review of Paul Ross's video, which brought it to my attention. A link to Rusty's video is in the description as well as a link to Paul Ross's. Paul Ross's message is weakened even undermined due to certain inadequacies in his presentation. One, failure to define terms. Two, simplistic and generalized references to science and scientists. Three, failure to understand the limits and purposes of the sciences. And four, failure to discuss the roles of faith and evidence in religion and science. So as not to make the same mistakes, it is necessary that I address point one first. Definition of God. The word is central to the discussion, but never openly confronted. When I speak of God here, I am referring to the God of the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all three of which have many variants, but all of which conceive of God as a being of some kind, larger than nature in that it exists beyond everything we perceive as nature while also the creator of all this nature and with whom we can have some kind of personal relationship. I believe theologians of all those religious faiths would agree that humans are not capable of a complete understanding of this God but that we are capable nonetheless of having a real conscious relationship and communication with this God either in this life or the afterlife. This is the God I refer to in the discussion. It has been my experience that some apologists will keep broadening their definition of God to the point of such extreme vagueness that it bears no resemblance to anything described in traditional scriptures. <clears throat> when someone starts waving his hands in the air and saying things like God is what was before there was something or God is love, there's little left to talk about on the subject. To quote one I saw recently, God is truth and truth has no religion. That gets us nowhere in this discussion. Definition of science. I don't intend this to be a comprehensive and authoritative definition. I'm just aiming for something that serves as a useful reference throughout the discussion. But in making this definition, I also address the earlier points two and three. These were simplistic and generalized references to science and scientists failure to understand the limits and purposes of the sciences. For a start, science is no one universal thing. It is more accurate to talk about the sciences. We have astrophysics at one end of the scale and molecular biology at another end. We have natural sciences like geology, and we have theoretical physicists working on string theory. We have biologists in labs working on cures for diseases and nuclear physicists working on the latest fusion technology. Sometimes people talk about the scientific method, but even this is best referred to in the plural, as every discipline is facing its own unique circumstances. But I think most of us who are not deeply involved in scientific work, when we refer to science, we're thinking first of all of the natural sciences we encounter on a daily basis, dealing with issues such as evolution through natural selection, gravity, and all the science and related technology that makes our daily lives what they are in the modern world. For the most part, these sciences rely heavily on a series of steps. One, observations of natural phenomena. Two, questions arising from those observations, usually exploring cause and effect. Three, developments of hypotheses as to what is being observed. Four, testing of these hypotheses. Five, repetition, repetition, repetition. Six, conclusions if negative, leading to new hypotheses, or if positive, leading to reliable predictions of future events based on the cause-effect relationships explored in the testing. Seven, development of technologies that take advantage of that newfound knowledge to benefit people in some way. Straying into the realm of politics, these benefits may accrue to all people or only to some. But in essence, putting this knowledge to use is the main outcome of the scientific exploration. These are somewhat rough but useful definitions I use in the further discussion. 
Ross creates a tone throughout his video that suggests a conflict between science and faith. This promotion of conflict is antithetical to the advancement of human knowledge and peace between people. Ross refers to, quote, the God of the gaps argument a lot and contrasts it with the naturalism of the gaps, again catching the discussion in terms of a mutually exclusive conflict. The God of the gaps issue is raised so often by people pursuing knowledge through science very simply because again and again, hundreds and thousands of times in the past, observed phenomena attributed to supernatural forces have been shown to be caused by natural forces. Science doesn't deal in 100% absolute proofs. It deals in evidence and probability. When something happens consistently 10, 100, 1,000 times, it eventually gets accepted as probably correct. Rust goes on, they assume the truth of naturalism in advance. When natural causes are seen again and again to be responsible for observed phenomena, then it is a reasonable starting point to temporarily assume that there is a natural explanation for the observed phenomenon and to pursue scientific investigation. If indeed a natural cause is then found and has strong evidence, that validates the temporary starting assumption. That assumption can confidently be considered correct. Future evidence may challenge it, but until that time it is accepted. If, on the other hand, inquisitive people were to observe a mysterious phenomenon, not assume naturalism, and ascribe the phenomenon to divine or supernatural forces, then having an answer, albeit unknown to them a wrong one, they would not seek further for a solution. They would not engage in a scientific investigation and they would never learn the true natural cause of the phenomenon. In consequence, their false knowledge would not give them the ability to accurately predict or control the natural forces. When one approach gives a solution that enables accurate predictions and the ability to exert control over natural forces and the other approach does not, some people may conclude that the former approach is not only the more useful, but also the more correct in its understanding of nature. I will come back to this further in the video. Bob Paul Ross writes, because naturalism is true, they assert there will be purely naturalistic explanations in the future for every single thing. Mr. Ross, your characterization of what you claim they say may apply to some small number of scientists, but certainly not all. That kind of broad generalization, quote, every single thing, is not the language of sound scientific discussion. Anyone claiming to be a scientist and who speaks in those terms or who claims to be engaged in using science to disprove the existence of God is not someone to be taken seriously and probably has no standing within the larger scientific community. Ross writes, so with naturalism of the gaps, they provide us with an endless list of materialistic promissory notes for the vast array of things currently unexplained. Ross gives us a little bit of lightning here. Sorry, I don't have any lightning to illustrate my points. I hope that my simple unemotional presentation will still reach and be meaningful to my audience despite that lack. When facing an unfamiliar natural phenomenon, scientists have nothing to gain by not assuming there is a natural explanation. Assuming there is not a natural explanation would stop the scientific investigation before it starts. Not all scientists are atheists, of course. However, even those that are theists when engaged in their scientific work, we'll start by assuming there is a natural explanation, since that is what their work is, the investigation of nature. We are approaching and almost at my main point, but I've got to address one more of Mr. Ross's statements first. Promissory notes for the vast array of things currently unexplained. Mr. Ross, I would be very interested to see a list of the five or six unexplained phenomena in nature that are most significant to you. We could then look at whether these have been investigated scientifically and the current status of those investigations. Then over time, we could see whether progress is made in understanding those phenomena as having natural causes. 
This would be a case study in another example of science filling in with evidentiary nature-based knowledge a mystery that might have otherwise been attributed to a supernatural cause. Are you interested? If so, please respond with some unexplained natural phenomena you find most relevant. I want to focus in now on what I feel is the really important point here, and that is the roles of faith and evidence in understanding nature, the physical reality in which we exist. I have seen many apologists attempt to argue that there is evidence of God. I start with this, John 20. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Paul gives us in Hebrews 11, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Paul tells us this is to be commended. Matthew 12 gives us, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The message is clear. The desire for signs, the search for evidence, is a symptom of weak faith and is not to be commended or encouraged. St. Augustine says this in his Encridion. Therefore, the Apostle Paul approves and commends the faith that works by love and that cannot exist without hope. Thus it is that love is not without hope, and hope is not without love, and neither hope nor love are without faith. Faith is central, the very foundation on which love and hope rest. So, Mr. Ross, I strongly encourage you to have faith and not seek evidence for the existence of God or the presence of God in your love. That is, of course, if you view the world and your place in it in terms of faith rather than evidence. On the other hand, many of us choose to explore the world and pursue knowledge of it on the basis of physical evidence. This is the motivation behind the sciences of today. This same basic human motivation has been part of our nature since prehistory. The steps of science that I described earlier arose through trial and error over millennia as our natural curiosity and our ability to communicate increased with time. By passing our knowledge from one generation to the next, first orally and then through writing, we were able to build the huge body of natural knowledge that shapes our lives today. This is the knowledge that enables me to write this script on a computer and share it to the world instantly through the internet. This is the knowledge that has done so much more. It has eradicated smallpox and made cancer survivable for many. It has stabilized and secured our food supply so that famines are a thing of the past. It has given us the power to fly across oceans and even send people to the moon. So Mr. Ross, enjoy your faith. But I hope you will also recognize that this fake conflict you present between those who use the God of the gaps to attempt to explain that which they don't understand, and those who start by assuming a natural cause and pursuing scientific inquiry, that this fake conflict that you promote is entirely unnecessary and counterproductive to the progress of humanity. Unless you wish to return to a time when the origins of disease were completely mysterious, when people had to rely on their own hands rather than on the power of great machines to do such work as tilling fields, unless you wish to return to a time when international travel and communication was effectively impossible for the vast majority of humanity, unless you wish to return to all of that, I hope you will accept the rightness and righteousness of the pursuit of natural knowledge through the tools and methods of science.